just give you a little bit of quick history on me so you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I've been in the job now since January, so going on seven months, so kind of a newbie. But I did grow up in Marshalltown. I moved here when I was two and graduated in 89 uh, from Marshalltown High School. Um, I just had my 30-year class reunion a couple weeks ago, and it was great seeing all my classmates again. And um, I will have to say that I think I'm the one that aged the least. That was kind of nice to see. There were a lot of, lot of gray hairs out there. I only had a few in my beard, so I felt pretty good. Um, when I left uh, here, I thought I was one of those kids, I'm never coming back to Marshalltown again. I'm going to be gone. And I went to Iowa State. I uh, went to college there. I went off to Arizona State to go to grad school and then was living the high life there. And then me and my wife got, had our first child and everything that we were doing in Arizona wasn't fun anymore. We couldn't do those things anymore and we didn't have any help because everybody we knew didn't have kids and all of our family was in Iowa. So she said, let's move to Iowa. I said, as soon as I can find a job in Park and Rec, I'll do it. And I applied for a job in January and I started March 8th in Sioux City. Sold our house and moved, uh, moved back to Iowa and uh, have not regretted any minute uh, of doing it. And uh, that path led me to then Council Bluffs and then to Marshalltown when the job opened up back in November. Um, I just felt it was one of those things that I should probably apply for and be in my hometown. And after the tornado hit, I kind of wanted to be a part of um, making Marshalltown new and fresh and, and again after the tornado. So that's kind of why I took the, took the job and intrigued me um, to do that. Um, so like I said, I've been happy to be here. Uh, we're very excited about the Coliseum project and the things that are going to be happening here in the next year, why it's being rebuilt. So um, all my history that I've put together this presentation has either come through a stack of files in my office, labeled Coliseum, different things throughout from when it was built to, to now, um, as well as some stuff in the Times Republican. And uh, Sarah from the library actually gave me some cool photos and some articles and stuff too that kind of helped out. So I am by no means an expert, and some of you are probably going to have some stories to tell that are better than mine. So if you do, as we're going through it, feel free to raise a hand and tell me something that you remember from that time, and uh, we'll, we'll get through this. So the Coliseum, we just had our 90-year anniversary, March 15th. That's when we, we kind of kicked off the whole capital campaign to, to re redo it. So it was kind of cool timing to see that all happen. Um, so it was dedicated in uh, March 15th uh, to the construction cost of $125,000. We'll get ahead farther to when we're going to rebuild it now. It's not going to be $125,000. Um, it was basically started out as a group of veterans of World War I wanted to see something built that they could use to hold meetings, uh, different public events. Uh, at the time, they were using other buildings in the, in the town that weren't conducive for, for what, what their needs were. Um, also thought it could be a community center, a gym space, an event space. So the American Legion formed a committee back in 23 to start doing some fundraising and getting people to, together to figure out how they were going to fund, fund this project. Um, they'd been pre previously using the Methodist Church or the high school auditorium, but that, those spaces weren't big enough for, for the meetings and stuff that, that they wanted to do. Um, even when the, when the high school was built in 26, it had a capacity of 800, still wasn't big enough for their stuff. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they needed a big enough space for over 1,000 people. Um, so this group got together, they um, kind of hired this committee and they, they said, you know what, we're going to try and raise $50,000 to then go put towards this project. So they got to work, um, they got this Frank Lakowski, he was their ch committee chair, he says, you're going to be our kind of big fundraising chair to go out and raise money. And the next day they decided we're going to share some stock that's going to go out and they sold 100 uh, of the shares to its uh, members and I don't know what the price was I couldn't find that to see how much that was going to get them to their 50,000 goal um, but that was just in the article uh, that I read in the paper so the project then kind of lagged so that's 1923 now it's 1927 they still haven't gone anywhere with the project they haven't raised all their money they haven't got to where they wanted to be yet so uh, they had this other big meeting uh, January 20th where uh, all the different military groups all the veterans from different places around Iowa come and meet and some outspoken guy from Cedar Rapids says, you know what, you should do this through a bond. And so that got everybody kind of fired up about that. How do we make that happen? And so they had a joint meeting then on September 2nd to go over that plan. 
They had a new guy take over, uh, Orville Landis. Um, and then also at that meeting, they decided, hey, let's just don't make this uh, for veterans of World War I. Let's make it for all veterans of wars. And so that kind of got changed as kind of their mission and, and maybe got more people uh, a part of the project to kind of steamroll that, that project going. So on September 15th, they put out a petition to do a $125,000 bond and Marshalltown residents voted for it three to one uh, to make that happen. So that forced in the city council to start making some plans. Where are we going to put this thing? Um, one of the, the, the places where they wanted was 20 to 28 8 West State Street, which is where it is now. Uh, the funny start story about that that I found in the article was there was currently a kind of stockyard on there where people traded their cattle. So the farmers heard about this and they're like, no way, that's not going to happen. And so they're all in an uproar, don't want it to happen. And so the council found them another location. I don't know if it was a fairground or somewhere else for them to do their cattle trading business and then bought the land for $11,000 to put, put the Coliseum on that. So uh, even, when, you know, even when you make a good plan, there's still people who don't like the plan and you got to figure out a way to make everybody happy. So the plan then was for a 100 by 150 feet structure with seat 2,500 people, um, which then the balcony, I thought the balcony was original, found out that came later. Uh, so that was interesting in my studies. But seating, seating capacity for 2,500 would have the, the stage area, dressing rooms, lobby, main auditorium, dining room, and kitchen. Uh, and then the upstairs was all the spaces for the different groups to have their, their meetings. So the general contract went out for a little under $80,000 to CF Reimer Company. Uh, September 9th, they laid the, the cornerstone. And I do have a picture of that in, in the article. Um, that got uh, put in September 1928. Uh, a thousand people showed up to witness that happening. So that was pretty cool, I think, to see. Um, so then construction happened. And I know I said heavy rains in August because it started out in September. So it could have been October. But maybe the rain caused them to not start in September. But anyway, the plan was to start in September, and their goal was to be done in January, which I thought was pretty aggressive. September, October, November, December, January, four months to build the Coliseum. Uh, so anyway, it took a few more months to get it done in March, which I still think that was pretty impressive to get uh, all that brick laid and everything interior done, because uh, when we get ahead, you're going to say that we're, we're going to start our project hopefully in November and won't be done until... Um, October of next year, a year-long process, and the building's already built. We just got to do some interior work and add, add a little bit on the outside. So interesting how things got done in the good old days um, and how well it's built um, to still be standing through some of the things that it's been through. So a dedication was held. Uh, the former mayor, Conway, kind of was the officiant of the group. All the people from the veterans groups came and talked and they spoke. They had music from Coe College came in. I uh, had a vaudeville show and 1,800 people came um, and like I said, the balcony was added in 34. So this is what's interesting to me. In 1939, Fisher Controls had their Christmas party there, and it says 668 people came and attended the banquet um, in that picture. I don't know where another 1,000 people were going to be in that group, so uh, 2,500 pe people must be standing room in front of a concert, dancing and moving around and not being in a chair or uh, having any tables in there. So. But that was kind of a cool old picture that I found. Uh, somebody's uh, husband who worked at Fisher had this in it, and there was a picture in there. So, um, And I also think it's interesting that everyone's facing the corner where whoever's speaking is when they have that stage there with the five Christmas trees on it. You could have put the stage in the back and had the people facing the front to use the stage as intended. But it all worked out. Um, so then in 1958, um, a group of Masons who were here in town decided they wanted to do to kind of uh, commemorate the building, um, do something special to it. So they hired a, a Marshalltown native artist, uh, Marge Benoit, to do the two murals that are in there right now. Um, two 12 by 26 murals. Uh, the one on the east side kind of is pre-Marshalltown when it was being developed, uh, the farming agriculture aspect of it and then the, the one on the right hand side is more in the 1900s and 1950s of uh, the landmarks that were in town the businesses that were in town uh, at that time um, so th that got painted and it was funny you know it took her 50 days to do that she, she spent uh, many weeks uh, researching and what she wanted to do 
um, and then 50 hours to get it done. But then, then in, the, in 1958, they, Masons had a big meeting um, and oh, unveiled the um, uh, murals. And some of the old pictures too. There's an old picture here that I'll pass around. Uh, this was probably, probably 40s, early 50s. Uh, I didn't know this at the time, but there were a bunch of car dealers in the downtown area, not where they are now. Um, and so they had a car show in the Coliseum. So they must have opened up the back door and rolled in a bunch of cars. Um, but the thing I thought was interesting was all the windows that you could see in the picture. And then the curtain for the stage went from wall to wall and not you know, where the murals were. So there was nothing there but, but blank wall in there. So interesting pictures with the uh, old cars in there and the windows and um, not having the murals in there. So then we're going to jump ahead a little bit. So what I found in my research was either in the, in the Times Republican or in my files, as long as there wasn't a big project going on or major repair or a major event, there wasn't a lot of news stories on it. There wasn't a lot of files because business was running as usual. So there were still meetings being held in there. There were still dances, sock hops, um, wedding, wedding receptions, concerts. That's probably one thing too is about this time, <coughs> there were a lot of bands that were going from Chicago to Denver to do their big shows, but wanted to do some, some smaller shows in, on the way because they didn't need to get to Denver for six days or whatever. Hey, let's go make some money in these small towns. So Clear Lake, the Surf Room Ball Club, uh, here, here in Marshalltown, uh, Vets Auditorium in Des Moines, a lot of these bands would come through on their way to or from Denver, Chicago, and put on their show here uh, in Marshalltown. And I've heard uh, that Journey, before Journey got big, was here, Foreigner, a lot of the other big band, uh, 40s and 50s bands came through and played here. Um, so that was cool to see. I couldn't find any list of any bands. Those are just stories that I've heard from, from people. So jump ahead, kind of this is like in 97. Uh, the city did a study back in 97. The Coliseum was starting to fall in disrepair. Uh, ceiling was falling in, roof needed repair. The brick was starting to leak in different places. And the murals were definitely showing their uh, wear and tear after 42 years. Um, it is a plaster wall that they're painted on. So there were being chips and uh, things happening to the, to the paint. So uh, there was a, a, a Coliseum commi committee, committee that met and then they got a art committee mural group, subgroup out of their group to kind of do some fundraising. Uh, they brought in some artists from Iowa State um, who then said, you know, you need to get somebody outside of me. They brought in somebody from the Minneapolis Institute of Art. They came down, looked at it and said, yep, here's all the things that are wrong with it. Here's the, all the things you can do to restore it. It's going to be thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars. At that time, the city didn't have that money, so they tried to figure out what to do. They got in touch with a local artist who I heard cut the cost. I didn't see what the final cost was, but they got the cost down a little bit and were able then to raise the funds to re redo the mural. So they hired the local artists and some other people to come in and do it. And in 2013, uh, September, the murals were, were redone. Um, also about that time, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back a little bit. So uh, the one big use that the gym was used for was for MHS high school basketball games. Boys and girls played there. Also Marshtown Community College played their uh, home games there as well because the college didn't have a gymnasium at that time either. So uh, what, what I could find was the class of 56, the class of 60, and the class of 64 all won the state tournament uh, in that Roundhouse. They, they played some district games in there as well leading up to those state tournaments. Uh, so this is the banquet that they had for the 1956 um, team that won and 1,200 people showed up for that. So that's, uh, they really crammed them in there compared to the uh, Fisher Controls Christmas party. And then uh, one of our council members, Al Hoop, he was on that team that won in 64. And then as you, everybody knows or maybe don't know, but in 65 the Roundhouse got built. And so there weren't, weren't, weren't any more home basketball games there, and I kind of think that's when, when not a lot of activities started to happen there because they were going to other places in the community around that time. So like the murals, the, the old Coliseum was starting to show her wear and tear. Um, a lot of work needed to be done. Uh, from what I saw, uh, SM estimates anywhere from $1.5 to $2 million, depending on how much of, of things you done uh, did in, in it. Um, I think at this time the Coliseum 
uh, or the city did kick in $200,000 to do some of these repairs. They didn't do all of them. They did some tuck pointing to uh, the outside facade to keep the, the rainwater from coming in. They did some painting. They did some ceiling work, but that was kind of about it. So there were a lot of repairs that still needed to get done. Uh, around that time, too, uh, the city applied for to become a, the Coliseum to become a national uh, historic place. Uh, and it did in 2001, as, as, along with the five blocks along Main Street from 3rd Avenue to 3rd Street, um, got awarded that district uh, not, uh, designation as well. Um, so that kind of helped think maybe try to get some, some funding to help make some of the repairs too, to apply for some grants, being that it was a historic place. Um, so again, in that time, 2003, 2005, some of that work, like I said, was done. Not everything needed to get, that the, the needed to get done was done, um, but it still kept the building up to, to be able to be used. Um, in 2009, there was a rededication for its 80 year, um, highlighting the, the veterans uses that were in there, um, as well as they kind of highlighted some of the things. And at that time in 2009, that was the 55th year of the Kiwanis Pancake Day. And that's one of the events that I remember as a kid growing up to going to all the time and the smell of maple syrup and walking through the sticky maple syrup and uh, trying to eat as many pancakes as I could as a 10 year old kid, which is probably three. But I thought that was a lot. Um, I also remember um, in the 89 to 92 range, I would come back from Iowa State and play volleyball with my dad's team. I was 18 years old and I, I, remember, well, I remember being 16 years old and watching my dad play and like going, I can play as good as you old guys. You, can I play? Can I play? And Park and Rec won't let you play until you're 18. So I, I think actually at 17, my dad got a waiver signed, and I got to play when I was 17. So I got to play with all the old farts, and I thought that was pretty cool. And they were still better than me. And I think so my dad was probably like 35 or 40 at the time. I'm now 48, and I think I was not as good as I thought I was. And probably at, at 40 years old, my dad was still a pretty good uh, volleyball player and softball player. So it's funny how time changes or you maybe doesn't change but your, your perceptions on on things are um, when I was 18 I thought everybody was old and then I was 35 I thought I was a spry young chicken who could still do a lot of things and at 48 I still think I am too so you're only as old as you feel and you act um, October Fest used it uh, high school intramurals used it the AAU went program on for a long time one of the plaques that I have in my office that will go back up when it's all rededicated is an AAU plaque. I was going to bring it tonight because I thought it was only this big, but it's actually about this big and that wide, but it lists all the Hall of Fame players from, I think, 58 to 63 um, around that um, list of people who are from Marshalltown. So we're, we, we saved all the uh, plaques and memorials and things from after the tornado, and we had those in our office, and they're going to go back into our uh, new, newly renovated project. Um, one of the other places, or one of the uses have been is it's been a backup for the Memorial Day celebration. And if you know that it rained this year, the Coliseum probably would have been used this Memorial Day um, had it not been hit by the tornado and not open. Um, but so whenever it rained on the Memorial Day ceremony, they would come in and use the Coliseum. So uh, it was a big enough space to accommodate all that uh, use. And I, uh, Steve Storjahan, back in 2013, 2013 was quoted as saying this is only the second time in 18 years they've had to move indoors, but he was thankful that it was available to them. Um, so we'll probably continue that use in, in the new building. So that was kind of the history of stuff. So we're now up to 2017 um, when we start talking about again the Coliseum getting old. It's not maybe being used for its true potential. Could we? Could we use it for other things? So in uh, 2017, um, there was a feasibility study done. I have a copy of it over here on the table. Um, we hired a company called GTG Architects to kind of survey the community. So there were surveys that went out to all the citizens and said, what would you like to use the Coliseum for? And the usual stuff kind of came up as dances, uh, wedding receptions, uh, gym space for, for sporting events, meeting spaces for different community groups. So. Uh, with all that feedback and input from the community, GGG Architects came up with kind of what their plan was. The other big thing was uh, ADA accessible. Uh, the Coliseum as it was was not very ADA accessible, especially if you're a man 
and you had to go to the bathroom, it was in the basement. And there was no way to get down there but the steps. And that was the other thing I remember from my childhood was having to go down to the basement to go to the bathroom like was the scariest place in the world. Like if, if, I, if I knew we had 20 minutes left before we were going home, I was holding it till we got home because I didn't want to go downstairs to that basement. And I still come down there since I've been back to go look through and I'm like going, yep, still scares me. Like there could be somebody, somebody back there. It's, so I'm glad there's going to be men's and women's rooms on the first and second floor so no one has to go down to the basement anymore. Um, so in 2017, we, we had this game plan that, that this is what we're going to do with the Coliseum, and we're starting to, to, to go do the fundraising. We're talking to council members about how we're going to fund this project, getting prices for all that. And as everybody knows, on July 19, 2018, the tornado comes through and uh, tears the roof off. Uh, the scariest part that I heard about all that was that our summer blast kids were in there. There's 80 kids down in the basement, um, and the tornado ends. They come up and see this. Um, and then get taken over to the park and rec office. Another story that I heard was a dad was at Hy-Vee shopping. You know, he got 20 minutes to kill till it's done. Tornado rips through, he sees it howl happening, drives across the viaduct, gets about Emerson, can't go anymore because there's debris everywhere, gets out of his car, starts running to the Coliseum, not knowing is my kid safe or not safe in there. Uh, he, he actually arrived as the kids were coming out of the Coliseum, finds his daughter, um, so he, he was uh, kind of on the news a lot for that. But, I mean, it's amazing that no one in all Marshalltown died during the whole thing. So, um, so that when this happened, uh, the sprinkler system gets damaged. Uh, it takes us 48 hours to even turn the ear, to, to turn that off because there's all this other stuff going on. Um, and then before the new roof gets put back on, there's been rain for months and months and months. So pretty much everything on the inside has been gutted and taken out. It's concrete floor. It's two by four studs. And you can see from one end to the other, um, it's pretty much all taken out right now. So again, I can't understand why it's not gonna take them less than six months to get done because it's pretty much an empty shell. You should be able to go in and put some drywall up and be done, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so after the tornado, I guess that kind of was a blessing and a curse because the total project uh, for the Coliseum was $3.6 million. Um, and we're going to get about $2 million of it to pay for insurance. So that kind of was a, a good thing for us. But the plan right now and what we're underway with, bids are out to, uh, council just approved uh, two weeks ago to put the bids out to contractors. We had a pre-construction meeting with them last week. Bids will be due October 24th. Um, and hopefully the bids come in to what our numbers are and council can vote on it the 28th to approve and we can start doing some construction. But the old stage and the balcony are going to go away which will allow us to have room for two full-size basketball courts instead of, instead of one. We, we can also have two volleyball courts, four pickleball courts, um, and ample space to do all kinds of different special events, concerts, uh, whatever you want, would want. Um, and then the old women's restroom is going to become a, a meeting space that will kind of have a long uh, conference table, uh, maybe with 15 to 20 chairs around it with AV equipment so that people want to service clubs and any, any groups could use that room for free to have a meeting, um, kind of like what we're doing here, and be able to use that for free. So that's the first floor. Um, up on the second floor then, uh, we're hoping to have one big long space that can be divided into smaller rooms if need be. So we could have, you could have a graduation party in there to use the whole thing, or we could section it off and have our Zumba fitness class and Taekwondo going on at the same time. Or two smaller events, a meeting, a couple, couple meeting rooms could be going on. It's all gonna kind of depend on the sound. We don't wanna have loud music going on while we're having this discussion here. Um, so we'll have to make sure how we rent it out. Um, but it's multi-use space. Uh, there'll be TVs in each of those areas too. Uh, again, to have different meeting, meeting space. If you're having your kid's graduation uh, party there, you could plug in the flash drive and have the, the video going and the pictures and the, all that type of stuff. Uh, as well as restrooms um, and storage space. Um, here's kind of an artist drawing of what the, the space would look like. So I'm kind of excited about getting some of the windows back. Right now there aren't any windows in there. So there'll be some natural lighting that will take place in there. Uh, the murals, I uh, should have mentioned that when we were talking about the murals. Uh, our, I, we have a meeting tomorrow with Marshalltown Company. We are hoping to take high resolution pictures of the murals and then recreate them in vinyl to be put back on the wall. So 
we're kind of showing them kind of what, what it would be like so that, that they're not going to go away. We're also talking about if we're going to touch them up to restore them again digitally or put them back kind of as, as the way they are. So that's kind of how we're debating. We might, we'll still keep the pictures digitally, maybe make prints of it, but we might touch up it digitally to then put back on the wall, look brand new again. Um, so again, some of the things that have happened in here, the pancake breakfast, the car shows, um, the, the different veterans meetings, groups, reunions, uh, we're hoping all those things can happen again. And then we're hoping that there's some things that we haven't thought about that someone says, hey, we want to have this event uh, at your facility. Can, can we do it? And we got to figure out if we can. A uh, couple, couple of the events that I found were interesting were there was midget wrestling that, that went on. And these guys have actually approached us and they said, once the call seem well, they want to do a fundraiser. I think they are doing a fundraiser at the Appella Ballroom uh, for the Coliseum. But said once that the Coliseum gets built, they want to come back and put on a free show again for us. Uh, the other one that I thought was funny was donkey basketball. So apparently they had five on five or four on four with people on donkeys and they dribbled the ball and played basketball on it. So I, I've talked to the council members and they're all in since Bill's here. They're going to they're gonna take on the PD uh, in donkey basketball at the, at, the, at the grand opening. That's what I'm envisioning in my head. Um, and then I, then I think if any council member doesn't want to partake, then they're in charge of the donkey cleanup uh, committee. So. I, I may get voted out on that, but I'm still just, you know, thinking that would be a kind of a fun idea. Um, and it will be back as an emergency shelter, which, again, if the, if the tornado hadn't hit in July, I think the Coliseum would have been full of cots and water and anything you needed for all those people that were affected. And uh, so hopefully we never have a tornado again, but if we do, it's somewhere else, and this can be used for it, what it was intended for. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're kind of fundraiser in a way. Right now we have $1.1 million raised of the, of the 1.36 we're looking for. Uh, we got a $400,000 grant from Martha Ellen Ty, $100,000 from Emerson, $250,000 from Prairie Meadows, and then the rest have kind of all been from smaller uh, contributions like JBS and uh, Lennox gave $10,000. Um, as well as some other just local things in town. We did have a concert uh, the last, last 4th of July weekend. We brought in Jason Brown and blocked off State Street, put on a concert. That was pretty well attended, and we got some fun fundraising out of that. Um, so yeah, this, this, I guess I didn't, I, just, I didn't update these because this was, this was fr from the Coliseum uh, timeline down was our grant presentation that we were doing, so I didn't change anything. but. So now we're looking at probably being done fall, uh, October, November-ish of 2020. Um, there's $3.6 million. Um, we're, close to, we're close to our 1.35 million mark. Um, a couple other things. We, we, we have a fundraising committee that uh, is Steve Storjahan, um, Vic Helberg, Kristen or Kelly Thurston, and then Al Hoop and Mike Gowdy. And so they've been going out to talk to service groups. Uh, Vic Helberg thought an idea would be to create a challenge coin. So we created a challenge coin that's got the Coliseum logo on it, uh, 1929 to 2019. We're selling those uh, for 20 bucks um, at the Park and Rec office. I think we're out of our first 200 that were ordered and we're gonna be ordering another 300 more. Um, so we have those available to help. Um, or go online to mtowncoliseum.com. So again, I'm hoping that all the bids come back here in the next couple of weeks and we start doing some construction and uh, by this time next year, we'll be having a, another party in the Coliseum to celebrate it and all the good things are gonna happen for the next uh, 90 years in the building. So the Coliseum sign will go up on the front. This will be a, a secondary entrance. Um, it, it, it actually, so, so if you've been in there before, the slope uh, goes all the way up. So it's going to actually have stairs making that all level uh, from the gym floor down. So it won't be handicap accessible, but there'll be some stair access into that. So I think you'll take some stairs to get to the door and then maybe one or two stairs to get to the level of the blue room and the gym and then walk through our veterans memorial area in, in, in that space. The, everything that is existing now will stay the same. The only thing will be the addition of the elevator shaft to the west and the stairs. Nothing else will be touched 
um, from the old building. Tonight. Now that now that it's a reality, we're starting to talk through all the logistics of how it's going to get used, how it's going to be accessed, uh, what some of the fees are going to be if you know for certain things if, or not for for certain things, um, how it's going to be staffed, all that good stuff. And I in, in the articles that I read, there wasn't any red tape. It was just that it's been around for so long. Why would we not want to keep it? Because you know, we, by the time they were talking about you know hundreds of thousand dollars to replace it, well, what would it cost to take it down? A couple hundred thousand dollars. So how about let's renovate it and still have it be used? Um, but I don't think there was any red tape that if they had wanted to at that time to knock it down that they could have. Now that it's on the historic registry, why would we want to turn it into a you know spend all the money to turn it into a parking lot when this is a memorial to the veterans? So you're, you know, you're basically tearing down a memorial, not just a building. Um, so I think that there was probably, not in reading the articles, but just knowing how politics works, that was discussion being ha handled in front of council, behind the scenes, um, that, hey, don't, don't do this. Now that the P police department's gone, we have all the lot s north of City Hall that can be used, and it's usually filled with cop cars and police officers' personal cars, so that's cleared off. I, I noticed since the PD has been gone, there's about 30 more spots in the lot than normal. We are getting two more spots out of it by reconfiguring it uh, parallel rather than the other way, so, um, but we're not, gonna get, we're not gonna get 50 more stalls unless we start knocking down some other things. Most, most nowadays when, when you go to a concert, like even the, the show wagon we have, all the sound and lights are off to the side and, and they're just basically using the stage as a, as a riser to, to see up so you could get some four foot risers and make a platform on to put the band on and put it over in the corner and have everybody kind of mill out from there. Uh, Katie asked if we, if we could drive the show, showmobile wagon in there to be used and I don't, you, you have to come in through the back alley and I know I can't make that turn uh, off, that, off that alley to get it in there. So whatever it is, it'll have to be probably a temporary brought in type stage. Or we would buy it and just have it down in the basement and bring it up for, for special events. One of the things that we had talked about, an idea with the murals, was to create some artwork to kind of go up in the, in the rafters that would do some of that def deflection. Um, so there is discussion in the in the rafter areas of doing some things to kind of help with some of the acoustics in there. Because if you have two basketball courts going on at the same time and people cheering or whatnot, I mean, you might not hear the, the referee's whistle. Um, even though you probably can't fit that many people in there as spectators, like with the, having the balcony there, but yeah. So that, that has, has been discussed. Well, I thank you all for coming out and taking the time. And um, I hope that uh, when we put out the news that, that's open for a grand opening, that you can all come to it and see uh, it is as like I hope it's going to be for the next 90 years. And I'm excited to start programming it and putting events in there. Mm -hmm.